during Paul's second missionary journey, he made his way to a town called Thessalonica. And there for three Sabbaths in a row, he preached in the synagogue. And after being rejected by the Jews as a whole, he turned to the Greeks and shared with them about this great salvation which comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. After only three weeks, he was run out of the city. He had to go to Berea, and if you remember, he was followed to Berea. He had to leave Berea. But after only three weeks in Thessalonica, he left a small congregation of Gentiles. People who had been given to idolatry, people who knew nothing about the living God. I think there were a few God-fearers in the group who believed. These were Greeks who had gone to the Jewish synagogue and had, had uh, decided to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And upon hearing the preaching of Paul, had believed the gospel and had turned to Jesus, were saved and had gathered in with this little group of Gentiles. And before they knew what had happened, their wonderful leader had been taken away, had to be slipped out of the town by night, and uh, was with them no more. And so Paul, uh, anxious about their affairs, sent Timothy back to find out how they were doing. And when he arrived, he found out that, that God was helping them and that uh, they were trusting. And he went back to the apostle and he said, Paul, they're doing fine. The Lord's helping them. And upon hearing Timothy's report, he sent them a letter. He sent them the first letter. And in sending them this first letter, he talked about many things, but he had two things in mind. I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter. And he sent them this first letter, and he expresses his joy that they are persevering, and they're trusting. They're holding on to the promise of God. They're not giving up because of their difficult times. He writes them to exhort them to Christian conduct. He encourages them to continue to do God's will. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, he writes to answer two questions they had on their minds. Well, the first was, is a Christian deprived of the blessings of the kingdom if he dies before the second advent? And he answers that question in the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 18. You don't have to turn over there. I'm going to keep right on going. I'm just telling you where it is. <clears throat> and then the next question is, when will Christ come in glory? They want to know when Jesus is coming again. I thought that was really sweet. They wanted to know if all their friends were all right. What's going to happen to our loved ones who've died in the Lord? We're still here, but what if Jesus comes again? Are they going to miss out? We want to know about this. And we want to know when Jesus is coming again. Paul, we're having a rough go of it over here. When's he coming back? Which is a typical question of new converts. Uh, yes, in my experience, they like to know when things are going to happen. When's it going to take place? And they're no, they were no different. They wanted to know when Jesus was coming back. And he answered that in the fifth chapter. Gives them this beautiful answer. Remember what he said to them. That the, the, the trumpet of the Lord will sound. And uh, the dead in Christ will be caught up, and those who are alive will be caught up with them, and thus will they be with the Lord forever. Now, Paul writes a beautiful greeting to these Christian people. He begins by saying, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we see the same triad of graces mentioned here as Paul mentions in the book of 1 Corinthians, faith, hope, and love. Calvin said that this could be called a short definition of true Christianity. Amen. 
Faith, hope, and love, all three in operation in the Christian's life. Each one of us must have these graces operating in our hearts if we're going to follow Jesus. Heart. It touches my heart, Pastor. Amen. Get it back. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We give thanks unto God always for you all, remembering your work of faith. Part of their work of faith was that they had turned from idols to serve the living God. Part of their work of faith is that their witness was known all over the world. Paul said, your witness is known everywhere. God's helping you so much. And we know that faith was operating in their lives because it was producing fruit. I found something, though, that's sort of unusual. Because, I found, you know, most of the time, you would, we would say, and I told some of my friends this today, faith usually precedes uh, works. We believe, and because we believe, as Paul said, I believed and therefore have I spoken. And usually when we believe, then certain things result. Fruit results as we believe and have faith in God. Mm -hmm. But I found something that's sort of an exception to this. And the pastor quoted this text tonight. And this is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom God hath sent. Mm -hmm. And the New International Commentary on the New Testament says that the work of God is simply doing what God requires. Mm -hmm. And so, you see, when we believe on Him whom God hath sent, and of course, the, I would say that the primary meaning in John 6 is they believe on Jesus, but a secondary meaning, which is just as important as far as I'm concerned, is for you and me, is to believe God's messengers. But when we believe on Him whom God hath sent, we are accomplishing a work. Exactly. This is a work. This a work is the work of, of God. Yes. To believe on Him whom God hath sent. I told somebody that I wrote in the little meditation thing that it may seem to be a contradiction to some people, but it's only a contradiction because we don't know everything. That's right. We don't have all the parts of the puzzle. Our Father in Heaven has all of them. He knows all about it. It's no problem with Him. No. No wonder God told us to trust. No wonder we're to trust because if we don't trust, we can't make it through. Jesus gave this to Paul. He wrote it down because, you see, God loves each of us. He knew that the only way we could make it through was to trust Him. He knew that we weren't going to have all the parts of the puzzle. Right. We're not going to have all the answers. No, sir. So He said, Paul, you write that down. Yes, sir. So that when the folks get to Scott Depot Christ Fellowship, they'll read that and get encouraged. Amen. He said, we see through a glass dimly. You remember? That's right. See, we, do not, we don't see in fullness. We see, we see in dimness. We just see a little bit. And so, we find here the apostle writing to encourage these brothers and gives them a little definition of true Christianity, faith, hope, and love. And um, we find that faith was operating in their lives. Yes, Through uh, reading in verse 9, verse 11, we read about how they turned to God from idols and how they were witnessing for Jesus. Then he continues. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to... This isn't exhaustive by any means. I'm going to skip on. Then he continues to write. And uh, I believe he makes one of the most marvelous comments you'll read anywhere in the Bible. This is a tremendous statement. It's profound. Because he goes on and says, For we know, brethren, beloved by God, that He has chosen you. Brethren beloved by God is a double term of endearment. Now, the word brethren is used 21 times in the books of Thessalonians. This, this double term of endearment, brethren beloved of God, is only used a few times in the entire Word of God. And it's used once in First and Second Thessalonians. And this term is only used by the Jews when referring to men of supreme importance, to men as David, to men as Solomon, right. or when they're referring to the nation of Israel. But what is so marvelous to me is that here is this proud Pharisee Paul, who he was proud at one time, he was proud of his heritage. He was proud of his studies. He was proud of his diligence. And he turns around and meets Jesus on the Damascus Road and writes a letter to the Gentiles who were called dogs by the Jews. It says, Brethren, beloved by God, we know you are chosen of Him. Amen. Calling the, the, the outcast. The people who, who knew not the living God and calling them the beloved of God, the very chosen, the very elect of God. 
Well, it thrills my heart because uh, it's a wonderful thing to, to me to know yes. that God gave Paul uh, such a vision so quickly. It took precious Peter about nine years to get the vision he had. And Peter saw the transfiguration. Peter yes. saw the miracles. He traveled with Jesus those three years. He knew all about him. He saw wonderful things. But you see, he had prejudice in his heart. And he didn't know that God loved the precious Gentiles as much as he did the Jews. Right. And he called them as well. But you see, when Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, God gave him enough in just a few seconds till he had the, he had the vision right away and God burned all that prejudice out of his heart. And he knew right away that God loved everybody. And that it was God's plan for everybody to know this wonderful Savior. He knew this. Yes, sir. For we know that He has chosen you. Now, during the Hebrides revival, when Duncan Campbell was preaching, uh, he found himself being opposed by the preachers. Yes. A lot of them. And they got to writing articles about him. <laughs> they'd write these little articles, you know, and they'd say, I tell you, this fellow is preaching that you can have assurance. And we don't believe that. Mm. This is a heresy. And uh, one scholar says that he was opposed as much over this as he was on preaching holiness. In fact, some believe he was opposed more over teaching the doctrine of assurance than he was over teaching holiness. Thank you. I don't know why it is that uh, the world opposes assurance. They really do. And uh, carnal Christianity opposes assurance. That's right. They don't like for you to say you have the witness of the Spirit. <laughs> They don't like that. And yet, that's what we're longing for. That's what we really need. We need the assurance. But before we get in the kingdom, why, we'll oppose it. It's paradoxical, isn't it? Yes, I understand that too well. But he was opposed by the preachers in the town. They they wrote this little track. One fellow wrote a track, and it was entitled, uh, Armenianism Exposed. (laughs) But let me tell you something. Right here, the apostle goes a step further than all those fellows. Yes, sir. He goes a step further than Duncan Campbell and yes. Wesley and the whole group. Sure. Because he said, not only can you know, brothers over in Thessalonica, but I know you're chosen. Yes, sir. I wonder what they'd have done with Paul, Pastor. Yeah, brother. They'd have done just what the rest of them did. Yes, they'd have sir. run him to Berea. Exactly. Brethren beloved of God... I know you are chosen of Him. Not only do you know it, but I know it. (laughs) We were in a hospital one time and uh, praying with a lady, Pastor Hogan, myself, and she didn't know she was saved. Right, she didn't know it. And uh, devil was fighting. Devil was fighting her, and she she's dying of cancer. Sure. And. uh, we prayed with her, and Pastor Hogue said, Stephen, yeah. can you tell if uh, she needs Jesus or is she clear with God? Yeah. Sure did. What did I say to you? Well, you said she was clear with God. I said she's clear with God. She's clear with God. Yeah. Oliver turned to the sister, and he said, Sister, you're clear with God. And she died in peace. And she died in peace. She went to heaven. Jesus told me she was clear. And I, Oliver relayed the message. He said, she's clear with, you're clear how, with how God. How did you know she was clear with God? <laughs> yes. How did you yes. know? I knew by God's grace, by the inner witness. By the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. Now, we'd have been into trouble if I had tried to find something in the scriptures at that point, probably. To prove to her she was clear. Yeah. Now, I might have been able to do it. I, I'm not saying that I couldn't have. But uh, God could have led that way. Yeah. Touches my heart that he could have led that way. Sure we could have got in the word and showed her. Yes, but see, he chose to witness and say she's clear. Sorry. So we didn't have to wear the pages out. I've never Bible. asked you a question like that. Yeah. I've never asked you a question like that. No. See, we, that's the only time. But I want you to know that Paul said, I know you're clear. What does it do for you when somebody says, somebody you love and respect says, you're clear with God? You're clear with God. You're beloved of God. You're chosen of Him. Amen. Well, while I was I was praying last night before choir practice, and uh, I could I, I could see how this this precious Paul was concerned about this little flock, and he was writing to them to encourage them. He wanted them to stay true and faithful to God. And in this out of this great heart of love, he wrote this letter to them. And, uh, you know, Paul had a lot of things that were against him. 
And because he had this vision, because God told him that the Gentiles could experience salvation as well as the Jews, because of that, the enemy was opposed to him quite a bit. Paul suffered much heartache and many trials. But in spite of all that, God helped him to be faithful. And he wrote this letter back to these brothers and sisters. He said, I want you to be true to God. I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to give up. And I thought, Jesus, uh, isn't it something that a man who suffered so much yes, could still remain so encouraged? Even though he was forsaken, by the time of his death, had been forsaken by all people. And yet, he still... And yet maintained a spiritual victory Amen. and didn't give up. He didn't get discouraged. He didn't get weary. I told the choir last night that I don't think any of us have any excuse for getting discouraged. Paul was shipwrecked and had many other things happen, whipped. But he didn't get discouraged. He didn't give up. He kept believing. He kept trusting. I told the choir last night that we can believe for a promise ten years and give up one day too soon. You can stop believing one day too soon and miss that promise. That's why we want to keep trusting and keep believing, keep holding on to the Lord until He fulfills that promise. I, I tell you, the, uh, the enemy will fight you in these areas. The, the enemy fights Pastor Hogue. He tries to take the promises away from him. He has to fortify himself all the time. Where did I tell you that I saw uh, Spurgeon tonight? You saw him to the right hand of the promise. And what did the Lord tell heart. you when That's I told you? That's the, 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 on the right side. I said, Stephen, Spurgeon was standing just to the, to right, the right of the promise the for promise. me. Standing just yeah, to, the, to right. the right. God touched and his heart. He, he told me it was to the right like he saw. So the enemy will try to take these things away. He'll try to take your promises from you. But, but may the Lord help you, even as these brethren beloved of God, even as you are, may the Lord help you not do that. And may God help you to be faithful and true, to continue to hold on to what Jesus has promised you. Because even as he was faithful to Paul, he will be faithful to you as well. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise to God.